Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Was blind, but now I see. So it was when I got an email from him that you've been trying to get a hold of me for a number of years to no avail. And finally, we were able to get a hold of me. I'm a very private person, as you found out. I don't open myself up to the trolls and people who just want to make hurtful comments just because they can. And then that gives them the ability to do that. Right. So my mindset is uh, it's too much of an energy drain for me to be commenting back and forth. It's too time consuming. Right. So I chose not to, but when I got your email, I looked into your research, your work, and I realized that some of the things that you talked about dovetail with somebody across the country finding out things that pertain to the legend of J.C. Brown. So I contacted you. We corresponded back and forth and he said that we should do some interviews together and we started down that track. We did a show with Renee, mm -hmm. Renee uh, Barnett. And at the time we did the interview, I didn't give up the good, so to speak, and give up the whole legend as to solving it at that point. And what I want to say here today is it took court to get me to go back into the library one more time to actually finalize the deal and prove that, yes, uh, the case has been closed in Stockton. And all the other charlatans who are out there who wanted to take a piece of this legend have them all now running for the hills because now that it has been proven, then it is what I say it is, and no matter what, people now can research what I've done and take it a step further and carry the right baton. Right, and that includes what you found out about J.C. Brown living right across the street from the meeting place that's mentioned in the Stockton record and all that. Right, and that was all. I got to the point where I figured out how it was done. I would have to get a private investigator to search the names I believe with a Hammer family who might live in Stockton or nearby. Lo and behold, my private investigator gives me a printout, which I have on my website, cdonesays.com, to validate that John Benjamin Body was there visiting his relatives, the Hammer family, and posing as this old British gentleman, J.C. Brown. And that was the conclusive evidence that proved why he would be on San Joaquin Street in Stockton, because he was staying at 1825 with his family, and John C. Root, where the meetings were held, was in 1784, north of San Joaquin. Uh, so there it is, the street, I should say, the tie-in. So after his meetings, he'd go home down the street, and nobody knew that's where he was staying. And then on the morning of June 19th, 1934, when 80 people were supposed to go up with him from the Stockton Harbor by boat to uh, the Cascade Mountain Ranges, he just simply disappeared. Police were called. They wanted to know what he did, how much money he took from people, did he steal anything, what did he actually promise them. And they all said that they feared for the uh, elder gentleman's life, the old timer's life, and that they believed that. Everything that he said was true. They just didn't know what happened to him. So he just simply, poof, was gone. So right. the police, their investigation went nowhere until I read the story years later. Right, and he never surfaced again. But then we have the strange part of the story, too, about some of the things he found maybe being in a, a bank vault in Texas, right? That's exactly right. After I, I piqued the interest of Mike Fitzgerald nine years ago, 
of the newspaper. He sent me the PDF, actually, story that was printed on June 19th of 1934. And in that legend, it talked about when the Hagen Museum director, Harry Noyce Pratt, pressed him and said, look, we're here almost six weeks listening to you. Do you have any evidence to prove what you're saying? There was 80 people assembled. And what do you got, Casey? He says, well, in the Texas Bowl, I've got artifacts of what I discovered 30 years earlier while working for the Lord Calgary Mining Company of England up in the Cascade Mountain, Mountain Ranges, which have to do with giants, an elderly, an older civilization, and artifacts that even the Egyptians didn't have. So here he is talking about a, a superior, you know, race of people that living in the bowels of a mountain, and he's got proof, of it. and it's in a Texas bank. And he also claimed in that PDF that uh, was written in the paper that he had been kidnapped once before, and his relatives, when they wanted to go back up there, started dying mysteriously. So finally, Stefan. You know, talk to me, and I don't blame him for not talking to me. And, uh, I mean, he revealed an incredible story that kind of hit all the bases of other things I had been looking at, different stories that were similar to the legend of J.C. Brown, and uh, things like that. So, as I continued to look into this, just recently, again, I was inspired to recheck it again, just like Stefan was. And I, I looked at the title of The Lord of Caldre, which was interesting. And I found that this all tied back into a lot of things that I had already written about the Frenchman's Tower in Palo Alto that was built by a man named Peter Couts. And as I checked into the whole uh, lineage of the Couts family, because I was interested in the Frenchman's Tower, I ran across a passage that described how they were related to the Lords Montague Caldre, who had owned the Caldre estate prior to Wheatman Pearson person purchasing it, and he gained that title through owning the property, essentially. But this is going to swing back around to where I find a connection even between the Montague uh, family and... Because what I found was that the Montague and Caldre names of that family were simply landed titles and that their real name was Brown. And so this again swings us back around to J.C. Brown because even the last title holder of the Lord of Montague Caldre was the ninth Earl and I-X in Greek letters is J.C. so the ninth Earl of Montague could also be referred to as J.C. Brown. And even more amazingly, we see the Couch family that built the Frenchman's Tower in Palo Alto uh, marrying into the Montague Caldre family. And we know that what I was fascinated with the Frenchman's Towers because I studied geography and buildings that are used as a place which to measure or map from. So I had already theorized that the Frenchman's Tower was such a place, and it is located exactly due south of Mount Shasta. So here we're seeing a double value that the Couts family ends up intermarrying with the Montague Brown family, and we see this whole legend emerging that's either, you know, telling us the truth of a hidden vault in Mount Shasta, or possibly a metaphor, a hidden treasure, or the remains of an important person that may be uh, at Mount Shasta. I mean, none of this means that there's nothing like J.C. Brown described, but we see these kind of family connections time after time and other similar treasure stories like the Beale treasure, uh, the Oak Island treasure, and so on. The mystery of Rain Le Chateau uh, involves some of the same family members as well as all of these other mysteries I found. And even the Couts family, I found their American branch was the Colt family that owned Colt firearms uh, because in Scottish the L was silent and that name evolved into Couts, from Cots to Couts. So that's very interesting that there's a link even all the way back to an original Brown family in English history that were the Lords of Caldre. 
And most amazingly, we find again the Pearson family related, intermarrying with the Couts family. So it's almost as, as if Wheaton and Pearson had obtained the title of Lord Caldre as a part of a family tradition. That's exactly right, how it happened. Right. And he was a Freemason, and all the people in his organization were Freemasons. And the president of Mexico, Porfirio Diaz, Correct. was a Freemason. And that also links us to, because the Count's family is related to uh, the daughter of Napoleon III, who was the one who invaded Mexico, leading his camp to Maximilian, the Habsburg ruler, and all of that. So there's a lot more that meets the eye going on with the legend of J.C. Brown. And uh, Stefan and I both have lately come up with information that just is really nailing this and telling you uh, what's going on and really explains some of the, the more modern values of Mount Shasta that we see today. That's exactly right. And going full circle and actually making the connection as to who the man was and why he was there, the family ties, the, the family tree, and connecting all those dots have led to my getting validation from the newspaper. This case is closed. Well, it's not closed for me because the family who lives on 1825 North San Joaquin Street still hold the rights to that vault in the Texas Bank and are still paying on that vault. It's an open account since the first was opened, believe it or not, like 1904. Right. So we're talking about paying the bill for a bank account generation after generation and it's still open. So my quest now is, it's not done. I want to know what's in the vault. Who knows? It's really up in the air. It's a big, uh, they, they wouldn't have gone to this much trouble for no reason. And part of the, the this kind of family tradition, we see people like the Montagues and the Brown family and the Couch family taking part in, involves architecture that includes directional qualities that establishes a prime meridian. So this kind of establishes a domain of what they feel they may own on some level, but it also, uh, in other cases of this, I've seen that it, it often leads to the secreted remains of somebody that has a regal lineage, and that there are quests like vision quests Native Americans have, where people that are rightful heirs have to learn all of the clues and parts of this that helps them identify where these remains are, and uh, this links into the kind of uh, man in the mountain myths we see in Europe that are Rosicrucian value where Christian Rosencrantz is interred in an unknown mountain somewhere in a chamber with a library of uh, critical hidden information. So really the treasure we're seeing may be information and the story could be a metaphor, possibly, uh, for something that they arrange. But I mean, the door is still obviously open for the, the original story to be accurate and describe what's going on. But these families all have traditions involving magi, uh, a kind of initiatory quest, occult symbols, and things like this that were left as a kind of a quest of initiation. And we do see Freemasons and other uh, occult groups using similar ways to teach people the values of their group and the people who are important to it. So this is also a kind of thing that once you start to discover it, it uncovers hidden history that we've never seen before that, that kind of can change your view of what happened in California history, American history, and so on. So it's really interesting that uh, all of this was, was told to us in a story with apparently a very humble man, J.C. Brown, who, who found this treasure and wanted to share it with everybody, but was being persecuted at the same time. Right. And so that part of the story definitely is likely true, that he just was forced to disappear, felt in danger, and had to leave. And Amazing grace. How sweet the 
sound that sings.